Hello there, welcome to this episode of Long Reed Club. Uh, some say Birmingham has more canals than Venice. It's not actually true, but we do have longer canals than Venice, according to my new colleague Mike Cox. And that's a tentative introduction to today's talk uh, from Long Gas Technologies. Uh, CSO and co-founder Aaron Darling is going to tell us about the opportunities of generating long read data uh, using just short read instruments. Over to you, Aaron. Hi, my name is Aaron Darling. Uh, I'm joining you in the Long Read Club today to talk about Morphoseek, a technology that allows us to generate long reads from short read sequencing platforms. And uh, please let me apologize in advance. Um, if you hear a lot of construction noise in the background, our university here is building new buildings as fast as it possibly can. So. Um, I'm going to be telling you about Morphoseek, uh, and this is work that's been done by a large team. Um, we're a spin-out company from UTS, and several of these people uh, were at UTS working as, as part of this team, and we have um, several international team members as well. Um, so the motivation for this technology is around genome assembly. As you I'm sure well know uh, there are a number of reasons why genome assemblies can break, one of which is that we simply didn't generate enough data for that part of the genome, and so we have a coverage dropout. The other main reason, and this is very common, is that um, there are repeats in uh, the genome, and the short reads uh, by themselves are unable to resolve those repeats. And so when this happens, we get a genome assembly configuration where the contigs on one side of the repeat um, go into the repeat and we do not know the association of those contigs uh, <clears throat> on the other side of the repeat with what went into the repeat. So we can't resolve these repeats. And um, uh, a famous bioinformatician, Torsten Seaman, uh, has told us that there are two laws uh, with respect to repeats and sequencing. The first of these is that we cannot uh, resolve repeats of length L unless we have reads longer than that length L. And the second law of repeats is that it is impossible to resolve repeats of like L unless you have reads longer than L. Okay, so long read sequencing should solve this problem for us, right? And we've got some fantastic technologies available now for long read sequencing from PacBio, Oxford Nanopore, and some of these new emerging linked read technologies. But it seems like, despite the availability of these wonderful technologies, our databases are not actually filling up with long read genomes. So if you go look at what's actually in NCBI, um, you can see that here. This is a summary showing in blue are the um, scaffold assemblies from short reads, and in red are closed circle genome assemblies where we've used long, someone's used long read data to, um, to, to get a complete genome sequence. And you can see that the scaffold assemblies uh, uh, are growing at a much greater rate than uh, the long read assemblies, unfortunately. So why is this? Is it that the cost is still a bit too high for uh, long read sequencing, or is it that the DNA requirements are too high? A lot of the standard protocols are pretty demanding, requiring a microgram or more of, of input material. Could it be that the accuracy is too low for some applications? We know that some of the sequencing technologies, like Nanopore, have systematic um, bias in uh, their base calling error, and so the consensus accuracy is still not asymptoting at 100%. It's less than that. Um, are, is it, how much of this is that there are challenges to the large black batch multiplex scaling? So are there limited barcoding options for these technologies? And is that holding people back, or, or is it just too hard to do this sort of high molecular weight DNA prep in a high throughput manner? Um, and with respect to the linked reads, one possible challenge is, is that the software available for the analysis is uh, still limited. Uh, there, there aren't that many third party open source uh, options for doing linked read analysis. So I'm not sure which of these reasons is the main contributor, but we thought by introducing MorphoSeq and developing this technology, we might be able to address some of these issues. So that's our aim. Um, so what is MorphoSeq? Well, MorphoSeq is a technology that allows you to generate long virtual reads from a short read sequencer. And the key idea that makes MorphoSeq work 
is that we mutagenize the long templates. And this may sound crazy because most people developing sequencing technologies want their sequences to be more accurate, not less accurate. So why would you mutagenize? Well, it turns out that if you mutagenize the sequences, the repeats get mutated out of the DNA sample. Um, and then you can generate short reads from these long mutated templates and short reads which have come from the same mutated template will have a common mutation pattern in them. And you can link those short reads to each other. And if you do this on mass, then you can reconstruct long templates uh, from a sample. Um, so this idea is something that's been discussed a bit uh, in, in the literature and the academic community for several years. But nobody up till now has gotten the chemistry and the algorithms to work. So what did we do in the chemistry that got us uh, where we needed to be with this technology? Um, well, the first step is to make long fragments with end adapters. We take 10 to 50 nanograms of input for this, and we use a tagmentation reaction. It's going to be TN5 or mu, and the protocol is adapted to generate long templates. Uh, the next step is mutagenesis. And here we use a nucleotide analog DPTP in conjunction with an engineered polymerase and a reaction that we spent a lot of time optimizing to basically introduce mutations into these long templates. We also introduce sample barcodes at this stage so that um, all the samples from all uh, can basically be pooled to a single tube after, after this has taken place. Um, and then the third step, we replace the DPTP with natural nucleotides. This creates a fixed final set of mutations in those long templates. Um, and uh, as the next step, we can size select to a desired size range if we want to. And then we quantitate and bottleneck the sample down to a desired number of templates that we're getting the amount of long template coverage per sample that we would like to get. Um, and finally, we do a bit of enrichment PCR uh, to generate many copies of these, enough to go into a short read um, library prep, the standard shotgun library prep and sequencing at that stage. Okay, so that gives us a data set where we've got a bunch of short reads that are from these mutated templates. And in parallel, we've generated some unmutated reference shotgun data for each of the samples. And our job now is to reconstruct the long mutated templates. Um, the way we do this is to construct an assembly graph from the unmutated data, and then we map the mutated data onto that assembly graph. Um, and then we look when we have overlapping mutated reads on the, mapped on the assembly graph to identify places where they have uh, a common mutation pattern. And so that allows us to basically trace a path through this uh, unmutated assembly graph, which corresponds to the long template that we had sequenced. Um, so uh, in doing this, we can get the unmutated reconstructions of those long templates, and we can take all of those and feed them into a hybrid assembly platform together with the unmutated short reads. Um, to reconstruct uh, a genome. And so uh, overall, this workflow looks like what's shown at the bottom of this slide here. There's a number of stages that we've incorporated into uh, basically a cloud-based workflow system. Some of these are third-party open source components, and others are components that we've had to implement ourselves. And so at the, the very end of this, um, we're, we're getting that we can put into a uh, long read assembly with something like Unicycler. Okay, so uh, we next set out to evaluate this technology. Um, and we did this by getting a set of samples that are fairly well known from the Human Microbiome Project. There is an organization called DEI Resources, which will ship DNA prepped from these reference uh, samples to you in the mail. Uh, so we ordered those up, um, and the first thing we did when they arrived in our labs here in Sydney was a little bit of QC on them because they had come from the other side of the planet. It turns out along the way, uh, they had probably suffered some x-rays or, or some other sort of degradation uh, process because they didn't look great on the gel. You can see the smearing here, and so uh, this isn't exactly the type of high molecular weight sample that you would ordinarily put into your standard long read sequencing protocol like a, a PacBio or a Nanopore protocol. But nevertheless, we were able to generate MorphoSeq data for these. Um, we also applied MorphoSeq to a handful of reference samples, um, things for which uh, there are good reference genomes available and which we were able to grow locally so that we could generate 
nanopore data on these um, so we could have a good point of comparison. So what does the data look like? Well, the first thing we look, like, look at is um, the template links at the end of the chemistry process that I described earlier. And when we put those onto a bioanalyzer, it's sort of at the upper limit of what a bioanalyzer can resolve, but we see a nice peak um, at around eight and a half kilobase pairs, which is in the middle of the size selected range with a, a tail that goes out past 10 kb. Um, so the template lengths are as expected after all the PCR. The next thing we did was we took uh, data for some of the reference samples and we did the sequencing on it. We mapped those mutated reads back to the reference genome so that we could count up basically how many mutations we'd introduced through our mutagenesis process. And we see on, on basically a range of GC contents for the reference genomes that we can achieve a six to eight percent mutation rate. Um, and that particular mutation rate is important as I'll discuss later. Um, but we're, we're able to achieve very good mutation rates uh, across a wide range of genomic GC contents. Uh, the next thing that we looked at uh, was the uh, ratio of GC sites to AT sites that were mutated. Um, it's known that some of these mutation processes uh, can be heavily biased in favor of mutating uh, either GC sites or AT sites. Um, we uh, have developed a chemistry that allows us to mutate these with fairly uniform um, rates. Uh, and in this initial data set, uh, it's about 3 to 2 in favor of GC sites, but we've since driven this down to uh, 1 to 1. So we get equal numbers of mutations at GC sites and AT sites. Um, and this is uh, another important bit that I'll, I'll get to near the end. Okay, so. Um, when we map these reads back to uh, the reference assembly graph, what does it actually look like? Well, um, here is a screen capture of a bunch of mutated reads mapped back to a reference sequence. Um, and the brighter colored positions are sites which are mutated relative to the reference. The dark colored positions um, match the reference. So what you can see here is that there's a number of mutated positions. And across uh, different reads, we can see the same mutations occurring. And this is the signal that we want to use to link those reads to each other um, and reconstruct long templates. And so you can see it by eye already in the data, but of course you wouldn't want to process all of this data manually by eye because you'd go crazy if you did that. So uh, we wrote software to do this. Um, the software takes in basically the, the raw FASTQ files from the mutated and unmutated reads and it outputs a FASTQ which contains the reconstruction of the full length unmutated templates as well as uh, the mutated versions of those templates, and uh, a BAM file that you can view in a standard uh, viewing tool, um, like uh, IGV or tablet. Uh, and so that's, that's shown here. Oh my goodness, Dropbox. Um, and you can get an overview of uh, what, how basically all these short reads are stacked in to reconstruct the long template. Okay, so we can get these reconstructions of long reads, but can we actually do something useful with it? Can we improve the genome assemblies? Um, well, uh, let's talk a little bit about that. So the, the lengths, of course, of these long reads matter. Um, and the reconstructions that we're getting are roughly on the order of what we would expect based on uh, what we'd seen in the bioanalyzer before. There's a, a peak uh, for this particular sample, Arcobacter butzleri, a peak around 7 kilobase pairs with a tail that goes out past 10 kb. Um, and we can see some smaller fragments that seem to have been carried through on the gel. Um, so we did this analysis of Arcobacter sort of by hand. This is before we had our fully automated cloud workflow set up. Um, and uh, we took the data and we assembled it with Unicycler. And when we did that, we were able to turn the short read assembly graph, which is shown on the left here, which had about 100 contents in it, into a single closed circle assembly. And this was, of course, a very exciting result for us because it was the first evidence that we had that uh, this method is really working quite well. So we were, we were very pleased to see this. But one thing we were concerned about was that this Arcobacter has an exceptionally low GC content. Uh, it's only 27%. And so we were worried that perhaps there was something about uh, that low GC content that allowed this to process to work. So we then went back to look at a high GC organism, and again, we processed this one by hand because it was before we had the fully automated workflow set up. Um, and this is Actinomyces cardiofensis. I think the taxonomy name has changed here since, but um, this is a 61% GC organism, and um, again, we were able to take 
uh, a highly fragmentary short read assembly graph and turn it into a single closed circle representation of this genome. Um, so uh, this is very promising. It looks like it's working. Um, we continued to put together the automated workflow and then we were able to process all of the rest of the genomes that we sequenced in this highly multiplex batch. Um, and when we did that, uh, we got a whole bunch of additional closed circle assemblies out. You can see a lot of them here. Not all of them are coming in closed circles, though. And when we go in and look at the actual data, we can see that the data should support resolving these repeats um, in the assembly graph. But uh, the software at that point in time wasn't quite up to the task. There were still more things that we needed to fix and implement the software. Um, so there's still a lot of room for gains in the software, and we're, we're actively working on that. Um, at a very sort of high level, if you have a look at the total number of scaffolds that we're getting out in these assemblies, uh, with Morphoseq, most of the assemblies are coming into single digits in terms of their scaffold count, whereas if you were to use just the short read data alone, um, it would be on the order of, 200 scaffolds in the assemblies for most of these. Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit about the more general properties of this sequencing approach and technology and chemistry, um, and in particular about the accuracy, because accuracy really matters when it comes to long read sequencing. Um, two sequences that look similar or repetitive to each other at 90% accuracy might in fact be very distinct if you can see them at 99.9% .9 accuracy. So for example, you, at low accuracy, you may not be able to tell the difference between the Van Gogh and the Van Simpson, but if you have high precision and resolution, you will see it quite quickly. Um, and there's this nice figure from uh, the Wenger et al. bioarchive preprint introducing the PacBio Hi-Fi technology that I really like um, because it drives home the point of how this relates to genome assembly. So if you have reads that are at uh, Q15 versus reads that are at Q30 for single reads, the, um, the contiguity that you can achieve at a human genome assembly can be quite different. So um, a Q30 read at uh, about 10 kilobase pairs, uh, which is over here, is equivalent in terms of what it can deliver in a de novo genome assembly of human to uh, a Q15 read in excess of 30 or 40 kilobase pairs. So, uh, you know, you, you, a short read, a shorter read that's accurate could be worth as much as a, a longer but inaccurate read. Um, so we went, uh, set out to basically evaluate the overall accuracy of the morphoseq reads using the reference genomes that we had sequenced. Um, and we decided to do a comparison against nanopore, but uh, of course everyone knows that the raw read accuracy of nanopore is not uh, great, um, and so it would be a very boring comparison to uh, basically compare against the raw accuracy. What we did instead was to polish the nanopore reads first with Illumina data, and then we compared the accuracy between the morphoseq reads and the polished nanopore reads. Um, and it turns out that even after polishing uh, the nanopore reads, there seems to be uh, sort of a, a limit uh, to basically how much of the error can be eliminated through the polishing process. So with morphoseq reads, we're getting a higher fraction of reads above Q35 uh, than we are of the nanopore reads even after polishing. Um, I'd like to, to say a little bit about um, what you can do with complex repeats and gene calls and how this relates to um, continuous reads versus linked reads. So if you hypothetically had a sequence where there were a series of direct repeats sort of nearby each other, um, and you were to sequence that with something like Morphoseq, you would just get a single read through this region. But if you were to do linked reads, uh, you would get a collection of reads. Uh, but in the repeat regions, you wouldn't know which read came from which copy of the repeat. And it turns out that, that might actually make it quite difficult to do variant calling uh, in situations like this from linked reads. Um, so that's a potential advantage of the continuous long read approach that, um, that we're proposing here and similar long read approaches that are accurate uh, would, would be able to do, uh, solve that problem as well. And we, of course, also want to know how we're doing on gene calls from our assemblies. Um, and this is kind of the expected result. I mean, there's, there's uh, no indel or very low rate of indel errors in uh, these technologies that we're describing. And so, uh, as expected, uh, we get full-length gene predictions, um, whereas if you were to do an assembly from something that's prone to indel errors, like a, a nanopore, 
uh, without polishing that with another data type, um, then of course you would get lots of broken gene calls and genes that are shorter than expected in your assembly. Okay, so how far can we push this? Um, well, this slide has a few uh, theoretical calculations um, for basically what we might be able to do with more physique someday. Um, so this first question is basically how many different copies of repeats can we resolve with this approach? And it turns out that this depends very much on the mutation rate that you can achieve um, and how uniform those mutations are and uh, how much of an overlap is required among the short reads that you're trying to link. Uh, and so if you require only a 50 base pair overlap among short reads that you're linking, um, so there's 50 possible sites that can be mutated and you use a 2% mutation rate there, um, then there's a fairly small number of, of possible ways of mutating those 50 sites and you can't resolve very many repeats as a consequence of that. So that's shown in this um, black dashed line here where you know, basically you're going to be resolving five at most 10 different repeat copies with uh, a 2% mutation rate and a 50 base pair overlap. However, if you crank the mutation rate up to 6%, um, then you can start to resolve a lot more repeats. So we're up to about 1,000 repeats that can be reliably resolved with a 50 base pair overlap. And if we require more overlap among the short reads when we're linking them, then we can really, really increase the number of repeat copies that we should, in theory, be able to resolve with this technology. So you know, it's, it's up around 10 to the 8, so we're talking about hundreds of millions of repeats uh, that can be resolved at a 6% mutation rate with 100 base pair overlap in the short reads. Um, so how does this translate into the amount of data that we need to generate in order to reconstruct uh, one of these long templates? Well, um, if we require 100 base pair overlap in our short reads, um, then we can basically calculate uh, this efficiency curve, this yield curve, where we're asking how many short read pairs do we need for each successfully reconstructed long template, where we've reconstructed it from end to end. And it turns out that, um, of course, that varies by the length of the long template that you're trying to reconstruct. And there's a sweet spot sort of in between five and seven fold coverage, and it depends again on the, the template length. Um, where uh, you, you're you getting the sort of maximum yield there. So you would target probably between five and seven fold uh, short read coverage per long template that you're trying to reconstruct. So we can turn this into a formula for doing genome assemblies for bacteria. If we take this observation from Ryan Wick in the Unicycler paper where most of the assemblies, once they had about 10 fold long read coverage in hybrid with short read data were assembling into closed circles. We can come up with this recipe, this safe recipe, uh, where we use 30x coverage of short reads, these are unmutated reads, along with 15-fold coverage of long templates. Each of these long templates needs five to seven-fold coverage uh, to be able to be reconstructed successfully. Um, and so in total, we come to about 135-fold coverage in order to be able to generate one of these closed circle genome assemblies. Um, and so if you look at what that would cost at current NoSeq S4 pricing, if you're able to multiplex the lane to its capacity, the cost to generate the sequence data to do a closed circle genome for something like Staph aureus would be $3.50, uh, or for an E. coli, $7 um, in a full lane multiplex lane. Um, so for the price of an extra value meal at McDonald's, you can have a bacterial finished genome assembly. Um, so in summary, I've described the MorphoSeq technology. Uh, it enables short read sequencers to generate long read data. Um, it's a very high accuracy uh, read technology. It's producing reads at about 10 kilobases in length. Um, the DNA input requirements are modest. It uses standard NGS lab equipment. There's no specialized hardware required for this protocol. Um, it's highly scalable in terms of the multiplexing. You can do this in 96 well plates uh, with sample barcodes. It's robotics compatible. Um, you use multi-channel pipettes. Uh, and um, so it should be fairly easy to automate in high throughput settings. Uh, we've generated data on the Illumina platform as well as the BGI platform, even though I haven't talked about it today. Um, it works on both platforms. It offers a fairly low sequencing cost per genome. Um, 
And uh, this long read data, of course, can work with existing bioinformatics softwares that handle long reads. Um, data uh, behind the results that I presented today has been deposited into NCBI at this session, um, and we're working on a bioarchive bio preprint, and we hope to have that up um, in the next couple months. Um, and thank you for your time. Uh, there's been a huge team behind this. Um, in particular, I want to highlight uh, the contributions of Lee Monahan, who's been busy in the lab developing the chemistry, as well as uh, our bioinformatics team here, uh, led by Mike Immelfort. Uh, they've done most of the work on the analysis that uh, I presented today. Um, and thanks to everyone on Twitter as well, because uh, you make um, life in Sydney uh, a lot less lonely as a scientist. So thank you. All right. Bye-bye.